The title of our sermon this morning is Faith Without Wavering. Faith Without Wavering, Romans chapter 4. In particular, uh, verses 16 through 22. We read 13 through 22 for context. We'll begin in verse 16 this morning and consider this final uh, paragraph uh, that runs from uh, chapter, really chapter 4, verses 17 down through verse 22. We'll conclude with the last three verses next week. Uh, It's on October 31st each year that we celebrate the anniversary of the Protestant Reformation together. We remember that time in church history. It's a very important time. It was on All Hallows' Eve, or Halloween, on 1517. In 1517, the Roman Catholic monk by the name of Martin Luther posted his 95 theses, or points of disputation, uh, to the church door at Wittenberg. Now, he did so, Martin, Lord, uh, Martin Luther did so, with the intention of merely calling for debate on those issues that he saw as vitally important in reforming the church. However, uh, students of Martin Luther took those theses off the door without his consent and do the recent invention of the printing press at that time. Within a matter of weeks, Martin Luther's 95 theses were all over Germany. Uh, It has been compared this time in history and that if those events surrounding uh, the experience of Martin Luther has been compared to a blind man stumbling in a bell tower, reaching out in the darkness for something to stable, stabilize himself, and he grabs a rope, <laughs> and soon the whole world has been awakened to Luther's ringing bell. Now, at the, at the very center of that debate, at the very center of that conflict that would follow between Roman Catholicism and the Protestant Reformers was the nature or character of genuine, biblically defined faith. It wouldn't be long before the five solas of the Reformation would become ingrained in Reformation thought as a way of distinguishing the Bible's teaching from the heresy of Rome. Sola Scriptura, Sola Gratia, Sola Fide, Solus Christus, and Soli Deo Gloria. According to the Word of God alone, Sola Scriptura, salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, to the glory of God alone, the five solas of the Reformation. And though the Reformers and all those who believe the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ would champion a salvation that is by grace alone, through faith alone, Luther was quick to point out that though we are saved or justified by a faith alone, that faith that saves is never alone. Salvation from sin is not faith plus works, but salvation from sin is certainly by a faith that works. It was an issue that was exceedingly important in Paul's day as he wrote this epistle to the church at Rome. It was an exceedingly important issue in Luther's day as he nailed those 95 theses to the church door at Wittenberg. And it remains an exceedingly important issue in our own day as we work through Paul's epistle to the Romans. Paul has been explaining justification by faith. He began at the end of chapter 3, and he's now moved into chapter 4, and we're coming to the climax or to the apex of Paul's argument, and Paul now uses the example of Abraham to make his case. This is a matter of life and death. Genuine faith is a matter of heaven and hell. The salvation of sinners or the condemnation of sinners. There couldn't be a more important subject for us to consider this morning from Paul's argument in Romans chapter 4 than the issue of what is genuine, saving, justifying faith. Now we're going to see true faith or genuine faith in the text that we're going to consider this morning, Romans chapter 4, specifically verses 17 through 22. And we're going to do that from the example that Paul provides in the text, the example of Abraham. We're going to see true faith in action, as it were, from the example of Abraham. Think with me. The demons believe in God. The demons tremble believing in God, and yet they believe and yet will burn in hell one day because they don't have the faith of a genuine believer. They don't have genuine faith. What should distinguish your faith from that false faith of a demon? There will be many in that day who will call upon him as Lord, 
who will not enter the kingdom of heaven. What should distinguish your faith from their faith? What should distinguish your faith from false faith? What should distinguish true saving faith from its deceptive counterfeit? Now we'll consider the nature of true faith under four headings. One, true faith believes God. Two, true faith holds fast. Three, true faith grows strong. And four, true faith triumphs. True faith conquers. It is through the means of true and genuine, biblically defined faith in the Lord Jesus Christ that God credits the believing sinner with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. God grants as a gift of his grace the righteousness of his own son, the perfect righteousness of his own son. He gives that as a gift through the means of genuine, biblically defined faith. By means of the righteousness of Jesus Christ, imputed, credited, or accounted to the believing sinner, the sinner himself is accounted or declared righteous in the sight of God. He's reconciled to God. He has peace with the God. He rejoices in hope of the glory of God. He's justified in the sight of God, forgiven of his sin, adopted into the household of God, a child of promise, an inheritor with the Lord Jesus Christ. And all of this through the means of faith. So what is the nature of that faith? How do you know that your faith is true? Is your faith the kind of faith that God accounts as righteousness? Let's go to the text together. Paul has previously explained in chapter 4, verse 13, that the promise of God that Abraham would be heir of the world, that Abraham would inherit all things, was not given to Abraham on the basis of the law, not given to Abraham on the basis of his law keeping or on doing good works. There was nothing, nothing that Abraham could do to earn it. There was nothing that Abraham himself could contribute God gives the promise on the basis of faith alone. It was simply for Abraham to receive the promise with the open hand of faith. Now, this is critically important. Trace Paul's initial argument with with me here from Romans chapter 4. If eternal life or salvation from sin requires any contribution from you or I, then we are damned. If salvation deliverance from the wrath of God depends upon or is conditioned upon anything that you or I could contribute to it, you and I are condemned, doomed, damned to die. You and I are dead in our sin. We can't contribute anything to our salvation. We can't contribute anything to our deliverance. All you can contribute to the salvation of your soul is the sin that made it necessary, okay? Therefore, follow the the line of argument with me. Therefore, verse 16, it, receiving the promise, is then by the means of faith so that the promise could be given according to grace and not according to the works of the law. Paul states that God saves by grace alone, through faith alone, so that, through faith alone, so that It could be according to grace and not according to law. It's according to grace and not according to the works of the law so that the giving of the promise might be guaranteed or might be sure to all the spiritual descendants of Abraham. In other words, if the bestowal of the promise is in any way dependent upon you, then there's no way that it can be guaranteed. If the bestowal of the promise, the giving of the promise, has anything to do with you, there's no way that it could be sure because you and I are sinners. But because salvation is entirely due the grace of God, it, the promise, is guaranteed. It is guaranteed to all Abraham's descendants, not just to believing Jews, but also to believing Gentiles. Verse 17, as it is written, he says to Abraham, I have made you a father of many nations. Now, to Abraham, when Abraham was childless, when Abraham was in his old age, looking forward to the promise, God says, I have made you. Look at verse 17. God says, I have made you. Perfect, completed action in the past. I have made you. I have already made you, he could say, a father of many nations. In other words, the promise is so certain that God speaks of it as completed action. 
It's so certain that it's spoken of as having been already done in the past. In other words, it's guaranteed. Salvation is by faith, and faith alone, not works of the law, so that it could be according to grace and not works of the law. It is according to grace so that it might be sure to you and I, so that it might be guaranteed by the faithfulness of God to his word, that it might be guaranteed to you and I who have the faith of Abraham, who share the faith of Abraham. Make sense? If it has anything to do with you and I, we're lost. If it depends upon us, we're lost. Now then, consider with me point one on your notes. True faith believes God for that promise. True faith believes God. Verse 17 begins, as it is written. That word, as it is written there, references Genesis, where God comes to Abraham with a promise. Genesis chapter 12, God says to Abraham, I will make of you a great nation, right? I will bless you and make your name great. In you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Genesis 15, God reiterates the promise to Abraham. Look to the stars, Abraham. Count them if you are able. So shall your descendants be. And God comes to Abraham again in Genesis 17. Nations, Abraham, kings shall come from you. Verse 5, I have made you the father of many nations. You see there, quoted in verse 17, Genesis chapter 17, verse 5. Now, Abraham believed that he would receive the promise. Abraham believed the promise. Abraham believed that he would be the father of many nations. Abraham believed that he would inherit the world. Abraham believed, okay? But did Abraham simply have his faith, hope, trust, joy wrapped up in that promise? Or did Abraham have his faith, hope, trust, and joy wrapped up in the one who guaranteed the promise? Verse 17, he is the father of us all in the presence or in the sight of him whom Abraham believed. Do you see? God, who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. So Abraham believed that he received the promise. Abraham believed the promise. He trusted in the word. And that is entirely because Abraham's faith was in the person who made the promise. Abraham's trust, his rest, his joy, his love, his hope was fully placed in the one who made the promise. So notice first, one aspect of true faith is trusting God's word, trusting God's promise, right? Abraham believes the promise precisely because it is God's promise, God's word to him, but Abraham believes that word. The promise is rooted and grounded in the character of God himself. I might promise you a million bucks, But how many here would believe that I have the faithfulness, the power, the capacity to bring about that promise, the fulfillment of that promise? I can assure you that I do not, right? It goes nowhere beyond just words in the air, right? The promise is rooted and grounded in the character of God himself, such that Abraham may believe what has been revealed as much as Abraham believes in who has revealed it. His word, Abraham can put his faith and trust in God's word as much as Abraham can put his faith and trust in the one who has revealed the word. So the promise is sure. God's word is sure. That promise is guaranteed. Why? Because God has given it. It is so sure. It is so guaranteed. In fact, it is as though it has already come to pass. As it is written, I have already made you a father of many nations. It's because God has decreed it. It would be utter foolishness, wouldn't it then, to say that you trust in the Lord for salvation, but that you don't believe in what he's revealed in his word. People say that all the time today. I believe in God. I don't believe in the Bible. Utter foolishness. Utter ignorance. It would be just as foolish to say that you believe in what the word of God says And then refuse to put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. Just as foolish, just as ignorant. Both amount to nothing but unbelief. Do you see? Both amount to nothing but unbelief. Our faith, brothers and sisters, is based upon a revealed content. Our faith is based upon a revealed word. Our faith is not without reference to what God has said in his word. We believe in God? Good, you do well. (laughs) 
But what do we believe in God for? We believe in God for what he has revealed, what God has promised, what God has done, who God is. This begins to get at the heart of what true faith is as opposed to what false, false faith is. True faith clings to what God has revealed. True faith loves what God has revealed. True faith trusts what God has revealed. True faith obeys what God has revealed. True faith rejoices, hopes in what God has revealed. Do you see? Why? Why is that? It's because what God has revealed is the word of God himself. It's not the word of some so-called prophet who alone goes into a cave and receives direct revelation to himself that no one else can substantiate, right? It's not the word of some so-called prophet who alone buries his head in a hat and translates plates that no one else can translate. It's not the word of popes or councils. It's not the word of fallible men. It is the infallible and inerrant word of Almighty God. It is the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed, is the light that shines in a dark place. So notice in verse 17, true faith, an aspect of true faith is trust in, rest in, belief in God's word. True faith is also then trust in, rest in, reliance upon God's person. God's person. Abraham is the father of us all in the sight of God whom, verse 17 says, Abraham believed. Then he goes on in verse 17 to describe the person of God, the one in whom Abraham has believed, the one who gives life to the dead. He describes the person of God as the one who gives life to the dead. This is who Abraham puts his faith and trust in. This is the one whom Abraham conceives of as worthy of his faith and his trust. He is the the God who gives life to the dead. The one who, in Abraham's mind and our mind, in Scripture, is the source of life. He is the source of life because he has life in and of himself. He is the self-existent one, the eternally self-existent one. He is the great I am. He has the power of being within himself. God, uh, the Bible describes God as being life himself. He is life, having life within himself. Incidentally, it's interesting that a proof of the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ is that in John chapter 5, verse 26, Jesus Christ explains that just as the Father has life within himself, so he has granted the Son to have life within himself. He is the source of life, being itself, self-existent. I say, he is independent. His life, his existence, his being, not derived from anyone. Both the Father and the Son are self-existent. Therefore, both the Father and the Son are fully God. Neither derives his his life from anyone or anything. The Son eternally possesses life in himself as the Father's eternally begotten Son. The life in himself that the Son possesses is no different than the life in himself that the Father possesses. Make sense? Sort of. (laughs) But that possession, that possession is an eternal grant from God the Father to God the Son. John chapter 5, verse 26. This is called the eternal generation of the Son. He is the eternally begotten one. But just as God the Father has life within himself, God the Son has life within himself. Having life within himself, the Son himself also gives life. John chapter 5, verse 24. Listen. Most assuredly, the Lord Jesus Christ says, He who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. Most assuredly, I say to you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. Add to this, God the Holy Spirit, who himself worked life in Abraham, to bring him from being dead in sins and trespasses to life in Jesus Christ. And so Abraham is said here in verse 17, to have believed in the one who gives life to the dead. He has believed God. Now notice in verse 17 also, he is said to have believed in the one who calls those things which do not exist as though they did. 
It's amazing in the economy of words how, de- how God is described here, right? A lot more could be said about the first part. Listen to what Abraham describes here as the second part. In other words, Abraham believed in the one who has the power to bring about that which he has determined in advance. He believed in the one who has the power to call forth whatever he wills, and even though at present it may not exist, because he has called it forth, it is as certain as though it did exist. That makes sense from the text? He has the power to call forth what he has determined, when as yet it does not exist, and his power is such that when he calls it forth, it is so certain It is as though it did exist. The promise made to Abraham fits in this category. Abraham, I have made you a father of many nations before Abraham becomes becomes a father of many nations. The promise so certain, it's as though it already existed before God brings it to pass. The promise made to Abraham fits into that category. As it is written, I've made you the father of many nations. So true and genuine faith believes God. True and genuine faith believes in the word of God, and true and genuine faith believes in the word of God because it is the word of God. It trusts, it relies upon the person of God. It's not a wish. It's not a vain, empty hope. It's not merely agreeing with a set of facts. It is resting in, it is trusting in, hoping in, rejoicing in, embracing the promise, embracing the word because it has embraced the one who has given the word. Being fully convinced of its fulfillment, being fully persuaded of the word's realization because of the faithfulness and power of God who has promised. True and genuine saving faith believes God. The fulfillment of the promise is dependent upon the faithfulness and the power of the one who has made the promise. Do you see? I can promise you the moon, but I don't have the the power to deliver. And that calls into question my faithfulness if I make that promise. Not so with God. Not so with God. True and genuine faith believes God. Next then, point two on your notes. True faith holds faith fast. Can you see how in all of this, this is genuine saving faith, genuine biblically defined faith involves far more than a simple decision, right? If you think to yourself, I made a decision when I was 12, I walked an aisle, said a prayer. And since that decision, I've lived as though I never made it or lived as though I don't care. Genuine saving faith, genuine faith is far more than a simple decision. Genuine faith is far more than a moment of profession, Genuine faith is a trust, a reliance upon the one who speaks and the one who's uh, giving the word. Point two on your notes, true faith holds fast. Look at verse 18. True faith holds fast. Abraham, contrary to hope, in hope believed, so that he became the father of many nations. According to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. Now that which God had promised to Abraham, if you think about it, was contrary to hope. Abraham and Sarah could not possibly have hoped for a child in their old age. Think with me. When God first visited Abraham, Genesis chapter 12, Abraham is 75 years old. Sarah is 65 years old. Now that's, for Sarah in particular, slightly outside baby birthing time period, right? Slightly outside a natural baby birthing window. Even for that time. In other words, the promise that God made to Abraham was contrary to hope. However, with every passing year, with every passing year since the time that Abraham was 75 and Sarah was 65, with every passing year, the promise became increasingly contrary to hope. It became increasingly evident in the heart and mind of Abraham, that for God to fulfill his promise would involve far more than God's blessing on a simple natural process, right? But rather, it would take God's supernatural intervention. It would take a supernatural work of God in otherwise impossible circumstances. With every year that passes, those circumstances becoming more and more observably, quote-unquote, impossible, When Sarah gives birth to Isaac, Abraham's 100. 
and Sarah is 90. And Abraham and Sarah waited 25 years for God to fulfill his promise. Now notice first, notice first, true faith holds fast despite circumstances. True faith holds fast. Abraham perseveres in faith despite his circumstances. And despite his circumstances, Abraham believed God. He held fast to the promise in true faith despite circumstances. Verse 18, contrary to hope, in hope they believed, meaning that they believed in God with hope with hope for the fulfillment of God's promise to them. They didn't put their faith in hope. It's not what that means. It means that their faith was full of hope. Their faith was full of hope in God, and they exercised faith with hope. Contrary to hope, or despite their circumstances, they expected that God would fulfill his word to them. And even over all those years, that expectation persisted, persevered. Despite evidence to the contrary, despite circumstances, despite natural impossibilities, Abraham held fast to the Lord and held fast to the Lord's word. Abraham's faith persevered, okay? This is the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints. Abraham's faith persevered such that, verse 18, he became the father of many nations. According to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. Abraham's faith persevered such that he inherited the promise. Abraham's faith wasn't the false faith then of a double-minded man. You see, it wasn't a faith that was on one year and off the next year. It wasn't a faith that began at 12, disappeared through college, and then reappeared in your 30s. That's what a lot of people profess. You need to understand what's being said. It's not a faith that is on and off again. It's not a faith that disappears into unbelief and then at some point can be rededicated. That's not biblically defined, genuine faith. Abraham's faith persevered such that he became the father of many nations according to what was spoken. Abraham's faith wasn't the faith, the false faith of a double-minded man. It wasn't here one day, gone the next It wasn't simply once saved, always saved that many used to give excuse to a lifetime of sin. It was a perseverance of Abraham's faith that led to justification. It was a perseverance of Abraham's faith that led to inheriting the promise. He did not, verse 20, he did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief. That's characteristic of all true and genuine saving faith in the Lord does not waver at the promise of God through unbelief. Does that mean that Abraham's faith was perfect? Does it mean that Abraham's faith was mature, fresh out of the box? No, it doesn't. We need to understand that about true faith too. Turn back with me to Genesis chapter 16 and let's look at this together. Genesis chapter 16. Does that mean that Abraham's faith was perfect? From the beginning, mature from the beginning? No. Genesis chapter 16, 10 years later, in Genesis chapter 16, it would appear from the record, 10 years after the promise is given, originally, it would appear from the record that this aging couple, uh, increasingly aging couple, is becoming doubtful. They're having difficulty. It's not a, a failure of faith here but it might be construed as a crisis of faith. They're having some doubts. They're having difficulty. Abraham is now 85. Sarah is now 75. And they had no doubt been trying for the last 10 years to have a child. It appears as though Sarah at this point has lost all hope of having a child herself. She's well outside the age uh, that a woman could have a baby. Sarah recommends now that Abraham produce an heir through her maidservant, Hagar. Sarah's thinking to herself, if God won't produce the heir naturally, maybe he'll produce the heir. He intends to produce the heir legally. And so she persuades Abraham to go into her maidservant, Hagar. Look at verse 1. Now, Sarai, Abraham's wife, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. She had an Egyptian maidservant whose name was Hagar. And so Sarai said to Abram, see now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Please go into my maid." 
Perhaps I shall obtain children by her. And Abram heeded the voice of Sarai. At this point, Sarah's lost all hope, hasn't she? Lost all hope that she'd be able to naturally conceive and bear a child. And God is the one who has obviously restrained her. And so Sarah imagined that God must intend for them to produce an heir legally. Verse 3. Then Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, and gave her to her husband Abram to be his wife after Abram had dwelt 10 years in the land of Canaan. So he went into Hagar, she conceived, and when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress became despised in her eyes. Now from this point in time, 15 more years would pass. In the text, there's silence. There's no more word from God until Abraham is 99 years old. Turn the page and look at Genesis chapter 17. And look there at verse 1. 15 more years go by. Verse 1, when Abraham now was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am El Shaddai. I am almighty God. Walk before me and be blameless. And I will make my covenant between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly. So God reiterates the promise, doesn't he? He assures Abraham again of his faithfulness to his word. God says, I will bring this about. Abraham fell on his face, verse 3, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be a father of many nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, which the name Abram means exalted father, but your name shall be called Abraham, meaning father of multitudes or father of nations. For I have made you, verse 5, a father of many nations. I have made you. Do you see? Verse 6, I will make you, I will make you exceedingly fruitful. I will make nations of you. Kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your descendants after you. Also, I give you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan as an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. So God reminds Abraham another 15 years later, of the promise that he has made to him. And he reminds Abraham of the covenant. Look at verse 15. Then God said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai. Sarai is a name that means my princess. It means my princess, okay? But Sarah shall be her name. It means a princess. In other words, a princess of multitudes or a princess of nations. Verse 16, and I will bless her and also give you a son by her. Then I will bless her and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of peoples shall be from her. Awesome promise of God, right? But now uh, to Sarah herself. Sarah would be caught laughing in the very next chapter about this promise. Abraham, verse 17, fell on his face and laughed. He said in his heart, shall a child be born to a man who is 100 years old? And shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? It would seem now to both of them entirely impossible, entirely impossible that either Abraham or Sarah could produce a son naturally. The promise of God was contrary to hope, you see, contrary to hope. Abraham said to God, verse 18, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. And God said, verse 19, No, no, Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his descendants after him. Flip the page and look at Genesis chapter 18. Genesis chapter 18, we pick up the record now again where three angels have come to visit Abram, Abraham, and one of them we know to be the angel of the Lord, the pre-incarnate Christ. This is a Christophany in Genesis chapter 18, where in verse 9, they said to him, where is Sarah, your wife? So he said, here in the tent. And Abraham said, I will certainly return to you according to the time of life. And the angel of the Lord said to Abraham, I will certainly return to you according to the time of life. And behold, Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. 
Now Sarah was listening in the tent door, which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, well advanced in age, and Sarah had passed the age of childbearing. Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I have grown old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also? And the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I surely bear a child since I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. And the Lord rebuked her, and the Lord corrected her and said, No, but you did laugh. You did laugh. What's going on here? There's doubts going on. Is Abraham's faith perfect? No. Abraham, is Sarah's faith perfect? Far from it. Far from it. Is this mature faith? No. What is it? It's growing faith. It's maturing faith. It's God strengthening their faith, proving their faith, testing their faith. It now becomes overtly obvious to both Abraham and Sarah that this promise will not come about through natural or ordinary means. It's going to take a miracle from God to fulfill his word. He asks them, verse 14, is anything too hard for the Lord? That's the essence of it, isn't it? Isn't it? Is anything too hard for the Lord? Absolutely not. And contrary to hope, that's Paul's point in Romans chapter 4, contrary to hope, in hope they believed God for his word. Contrary to hope, think with me. The Lord revealed his promise to them 25 years earlier. And for 25 years, they've been trusting in the Lord for this promise. Have they always believed perfectly? No. Do they sometimes battle death, battle doubt? Yes. They even laughed at it. Not understanding how it would be possible for them to have a child in their old age, would we say that they had a mature faith? No. But what do we have recorded in the Word of God, Romans chapter 4, as the testimony of their faith, contrary to hope? They believed God. Their faith persevered despite their doubts. That faith, I've heard it said before that a genuine faith is not a fragile faith. To us, it often feels fragile. It can often feel weak. But genuine faith will last. Genuine faith will pass the test. They came to believe that the promise certainly would not could not be fulfilled through natural means. Abraham and Sarah came to believe that the promise could only be fulfilled through supernatural means, and yet they persevered and believed God. Now they would not only have to trust in God's word to fulfill the promise naturally, but they would now have to trust in God's power to fulfill the promise supernaturally. It was certainly not a perfect faith. Until now, it wasn't even yet a mature faith. But it is a persevering faith. It is a faith that holds fast. Do you see? And God will bring it to maturity. It's interesting here to think about it. But faith grows. Faith matures. Faith is strengthened when it's exercised. Faith grows. It's matured when it's stretched. When it's put to the test. When it's pushed to the limits. And God will see to it that your faith is strengthened. God will see to it that your faith is matured. If you're in Christ, you have a growing, maturing, persevering faith. We have ourselves an inheritance waiting for us, don't we? God determines to grow and mature our faith. And he's going to grow and mature your faith in the crucible of difficulty. He's going to forge our faith In the fire of adversity, we have an inheritance waiting for us, incorruptible, undefiled. It's reserved in heaven, does not fade away. In this, Peter says, we greatly rejoice, even though now in this life, for a little while, if need be, we are grieved by various trials. It's through the means of these various trials that Peter says, the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, you love. So after 25 years of testing, by the time that God visits Abraham once more, before finally 
fulfilling the promise that he had made 25 years earlier. What is the testimony of Abraham's faith? Look back at Romans chapter 4 and look there at verse 19. After 25 years, doubts, difficulty, adversity, growth, maturing, God working, forging their fire, uh, their faith in the crucible of difficulty, forging their faith in the fire of adversity. What is the testimony of Abraham's faith? Look at verse 19. And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead since he was about 100 years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief. That's where God takes our faith. Amen. Not only did Abraham's faith hold fast despite its circumstances, Abraham's faith held fast despite all evidence to the contrary. Contrary to hope, in hope or with hope, they believed God. God is the one who can give life from the dead. Abraham looked at his body, considered it dead. God is the one who can give life from the dead. Sarah considered her, her own womb dead. God is the one who gives life from the dead. God is the one who calls forth those things which do not exist as though they did. In other words, God has the power to fill his word. God is worthy of our faith. Incidentally, in verse 19, there's a variant there. The variant's difficult to ascertain. Your New King James, if you're reading that translation, includes the word not. Not being weak, weak in faith, Abraham did not consider his own body. The ESV, the NASB, does not include the word not. In other words, without weaken, weakening his faith, ESV, NASB, he considered his own body dead. Okay? Giving the sense, the first gives the sense that Abraham's faith was so strong that he didn't even consider by this point that his own body should be dead or that he should be physically incapacitated from having children. He believed the promise and considered, did not consider the fact that his body was incapacitated. The sense given in the NASB or the ESV is that Abraham believed God despite the reality of his physical incapacity. Now, though both of these are certainly plausible, it would seem to me that the ESV or the NASB has it right, especially concerning the Genesis account, right? Abraham had both, Abraham and Sarah had both considered their bodies incapable. They had both considered their bodies dead, as it were, incapable of producing children. That was their circumstances. That was the reality. And we're not to believe God without or against necessarily reality. It doesn't negate reality, right? That was their reality. Their bodies were incapable physically of producing children. That was their circumstances. Though by the end, despite their circumstances, despite all evidence to the contrary, contrary to hope, Abraham and Sarah believed God, right? Contrary to their circumstances, Abraham and Sarah believed God, and it didn't weaken their faith. Their faith in God over time and through adversity was only strengthened. And with mature faith, mature faith, that reality that Abraham and Sarah were physically incapacitated from having children, that reality was simply of no consequence. Nothing, nothing is too hard for the Lord. So true faith believes God. True faith holds fast. So you're listening to this as you think about the example of Abraham's faith. As you, as you think about the example of Sarah's faith, think about circumstances in your own life. The difficulties that you have faced, many of you have faced substantial, significant difficulty in your Christian lives. How's your faith weathered those storms? Is it stronger today than it was then? Has the Lord used that adversity, used that difficulty to mature your faith, to grow your faith? Has your faith persevered or is it lacking today? Has it lasted? Do you see in your own experience of faith this example of Abraham and Sarah? Can you say that you've responded the way that Abraham and Sarah have responded? This is an example. This is an illustration of true, genuine, biblically defined faith, right? True faith believes God. True faith holds fast. Next, 
Hang in there with me. True faith grows strong. Verse 20. Abraham did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. Now, that doesn't mean that Abraham didn't have difficulty. It doesn't mean that he didn't doubt. It doesn't mean that genuine faith is unwavering and mature, fresh out of the box. And we see that to be true in the experience of Abraham and Sarah. But what Paul is referring to here is a settled disposition of rejecting God's promise through unbelief. Abraham did not waver at the promise with a settled disposition of rejecting God's promise through unbelief. It's not unlike the 10 spies who returned from the land with a bad report and refused to enter, or that first generation, the emancipation generation that came out of Egypt, all at the, at the border of the promised land, refused to go in because of unbelief, because of faithlessness. They did not believe God. That one who wavers at the promise of God through unbelief is one like that, right? Paul is not saying, uh, not saying that Abraham didn't doubt or that his faith didn't have difficulties, but he did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief. That first generation died in the wilderness. All of them except Joshua and Caleb, God having sworn an oath, they would not enter his rest. But Abraham's faith, Abraham's faith was not like the fake faith or the false faith of those, or the fake faith or false faith of the double-minded man in James chapter 1 who's unstable in all his ways. Though Abraham's faith was not a perfect faith, Abraham's faith was not even a mature faith. It was a persevering faith, a lasting faith. And because it is a persevering faith, it is a maturing faith. Because it perseveres, it is growing stronger. It is a faith that is strengthened by God's word. It is a faith that is strengthened by the means which God has appointed, and it does not waver at the promises. It is a faith that is motivated ultimately by God's glory. Look at verse 20. Abraham did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, was strengthened in his faith, giving glory to God. To apply the words of Peter, the genuineness of Abraham's faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it was tested by fire, was now found to praise, honor, and glorify God. It's in this kind of faith, a growing, maturing, tested, and proven faith, a faith in God without any possibility of boasting on Abraham's part. It was in this, with this kind of faith that God is glorified. Well, what is the end of Abraham's faith? What is the end of all true, genuine, biblical faith? Look at point four on your notes. True faith now triumphs. True faith triumphs. Verse 21. So now, being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. In other words, being fully convinced by the word of God, being fully convinced by the person of God, the power of God, Abraham exercised the kind of faith that God accounts as righteousness. Now notice, it's the promise that fuels his faith knowing that God was able to fulfill it, he was fully convinced that what God had promised, God was also able to perform. You and I have to do the same. We have to fuel the fire of our faith with knowing his word and knowing him. Knowing his word and trusting in who he is and what he's done. And therefore, verse 22, it was accounted to him for righteousness. If you read verse 21 and verse 22... We might have a tendency at the end of this paragraph to look at that and to think of this as a reward, right? After all that Abraham has been through, after all the growth, after all the maturity evident in Abraham's faith, after all that perseverance, Abraham's faith lasting through trial and adversity, now God finally accounted to Abraham's faith the righteousness of Jesus Christ, whereby Abraham was justified in God's sight. Right? We might have a tendency to see it at the end of the paragraph as a reward. That's not what Paul intends to communicate here, is it? Though Abraham's faith was not perfect, though Abraham sometimes battled doubts and battled difficulty, he never wavered through unbelief. Abraham was fully convinced. And when was he fully convinced? At the very beginning. At the very beginning. That day, all the way back in Genesis chapter 12, when God told him to leave his country and go to a land that he would show him. What did Abraham do? 
Abraham believed God and he packed his bags. Right? And he followed. He followed the Lord. By, Abraham, by faith, Abraham, Abraham put his faith in the Lord and went to the land that the Lord showed him. Turn with me quickly to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. And Hebrews records this for us as well, giving evidence of Abraham's faith here. Hebrews chapter 11, and drop down with me to verse 8. Verse 8. By faith, when was Abraham genuinely saved? When God called him, and Abraham, by faith, followed the Lord. Right? Verse 8. By faith, Abraham obeyed. It wasn't that Abraham obeyed in order to earn justification. Abraham believed God, and because he believed God, he obeyed. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. That was all the way back in Genesis chapter 12 at the very beginning. And he went out not knowing where he was going. He trusted the Lord. By faith, he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country, like a foreigner, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. Why? Verse 10. Because he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. He has faith in the Lord. He believes the Lord. And so he obeys the Lord and he waits for the Lord to fulfill his word. He is fully convinced that God will do it. He is fully persuaded that God has the power to do it. He has put his faith in the Lord, right? Verse 11. By faith. Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child when she was past the age because she judged him faithful who had promised. She believed in the word, and she believed in the one who revealed the word. Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead were born as many as the stars of the sky in multitude, innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. That multitude includes you and I, who have the faith of Abraham. We're among that multitude. Amen? These, speaking of Abraham and those Old Testament saints, these all died in faith, not having received the promises yet, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. This is not our home, brothers and sisters. Our citizenship is not here. Our citizenship is in heaven. Verse 14. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had uh, called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, that is, a heavenly country. We share that desire with them, don't we? Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. God would see to it that Abraham's faith would grow. God would see to it that Abraham's faith would mature so strong as to whether even the greatest of trials, look at verse 17, even the greatest of trials, verse 17, by faith, and by this point, a maturing or a matured faith, a strong faith, by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, he went up the mountain with a knife in his hand and he offered up Isaac as he had received the promises, offered up his only begotten son of whom it was said, in Isaac, your seed shall be called concluding, believing in his heart and in his mind that God was able to raise him up even from the dead from which he also received him in a figurative sense. When the Lord provided a substitute, it was as though Abraham had received his son from the dead because Abraham was fully expecting to sacrifice his son as God had commanded. Right? True faith believes God. True faith holds fast. True faith grows strong. True faith triumphs. Consider in conclusion with me the outcome then of Abraham's faith. Consider the outcome. Look at verse 18, Romans chapter 4, verse 18. Abraham received the promise. Then he? he has become the father of many nations. The Lord Jesus Christ has come from the lineage of Abraham. Verse 20, 
Abraham glorified God. What is the outcome of Abraham's faith? It glorified God. What is the outcome of your genuine faith? It glorifies God. Verse 22, Abraham's faith was accounted to him for righteousness. Abraham's faith was the kind of faith that God accounts as righteousness to those who believe. Abraham's faith is an illustration of genuine faith, true faith. It's not an exhaustive treatment of the nature of faith, but a faithful representative example of the kind of faith that God accepts and God accounts for righteousness. The kind of faith that God uses as a means to justify sinners through Jesus Christ. So in thinking about this, what's the lesson for us then this morning? What's the lesson? You and I are justified by the same faith. You and I are justified by the same kind of faith as Abraham. We are granted the righteousness of Jesus Christ through the means of the same kind of faith that Abraham is illustrative of in Genesis and what we see in Hebrews chapter 11. He is the father of us all. We are his seed through our shared faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, in one sense, you could say this morning, do you want to know that your faith is true? Do you want to know that your faith is genuine? Look to the example of Abraham. Do you want to know that your faith is the kind of faith that God accounts for righteousness? Look to the example of Abraham. What is the nature of your faith? What is the character of your faith? As you sit here this morning and you consider your own faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, what is the nature, what is the character of your faith? Have you wavered through unbelief? Some say, I believed when I was 12, and I lived for myself for the next 20 years. That's not genuine faith. That's not genuine faith. Genuine faith perseveres like Abraham's faith. Not perfect, not without difficulty, but not failing through unbelief. Do you see? What is the nature and character of your faith? Is your faith of that character that God accounts as righteousness? Does it trust and rest in God's word? Does it trust and rest in his person? Does it trust and rest in the power of God and in the faithfulness of God to fulfill his word? Has your faith persevered through time, through trial, through adversity, through difficulty? Has your faith, despite your circumstances and despite evidence of the contrary, has your faith persevered? Or in those moments, has it gone missing altogether? Has it persevered in obedience? Or would you presume to confess that your faith, your so-called faith, has persevered in disobedience? Have you taken matters into your own hands? Or are you relying to this day on him? God will see to it through adversity, through trial, through difficulty, that your faith is tested. He will often strip you of all hope in anything but himself. If you remember when we were going through 2 Corinthians, and in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul says that he and his travel companions were in a trial, a difficulty, in which they despaired even of life itself. They thought they were going to die. And Paul says there that they went through that trial. God put them through that trial so that they would learn to trust in the one who raises the dead. God expects you and I to depend upon his word, to depend upon him alone. Has the Lord been growing your faith? Is it stronger today? Is your faith in the Lord stronger today than when you first set out? Do you see it growing now? Don't allow yourself to waver in your faith. Can you see how far different that is than this is than simply deciding to believe, than making a decision, right? Truly believing and deciding to believe are two entirely different things. What we see here exemplified in Abraham is true belief, genuine faith. Has your decision proceeded from a spirit-given conviction that is fully persuaded? Look to Abraham as your example, right? As you look to Jesus Christ in faith, Look to the examples that we see on the pages of Scripture. And may you, may I do so to the saving of our souls for the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. May God be glorified. Let's pray together. Pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you 
for how gracious you are, how merciful you are to us in condescending, in patience with us to communicate in these ways, in these terms, the nature of genuine faith. Thank you, Lord, for not leaving us uh, without an example. Uh, thank you, Lord, for not leaving us out without a testimony of that faith which you account for righteousness. And thank you, Lord, for the love that you've demonstrated toward us in calling us to examine our own selves, our own faith in light of this example that we find here in Romans chapter 4. And may it be to the edification of your people, the building up of their faith, the strengthening of their faith, the, the encouragement of their faith. May it be, uh, Lord, to the genuine repentance of those who have, uh, those genuine believers who may have late uh, been tempted to forsake the means of grace that you have appointed, those who have grown weary in well-doing, or those who have um, slowed their pace, so to speak, or have turned from the means which you have appointed to grow their faith and, Lord, are walking faithlessly. I pray, Lord, that they would uh, be a means to their repentance, that you would grant them genuine repentance, that they would turn to you again with renewed faith, with renewed commitment, endeavoring after new obedience. And for those, Lord, here who are unconverted, I pray that they would consider, Lord, the faith that you've called for, the promises that you've made, the power that you have to fulfill them, and, Lord, that they would turn from their sin to put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ that they might be saved. We love you, Lord. We thank you that you've revealed yourself to us in these ways. May it be to your everlasting glory and to the praise of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen.